uh, umbrella topic of assessment of volume status and mechanisms of hypertension is the more obscure topic of looking at volume responsiveness by assessment of velocity time integral variation. So what this concept has to do with is that we've now more and more literature has shown the ability of dynamic parameter monitoring to determine when somebody is volume responsive. Typically this is done uh, via various tech hemodynamic monitoring technologies or looking at the arterial waveform or um, looking at the pulse ox waveform. All of these things uh, essentially looking for percent changes in some representation of the patient's stroke volume and looking for variations in that um, stroke volume uh, connection parameter uh, to see it during somebody who has a controlled mechanical ventilation to see if, if in fact they'd be fluid responsive. The point of this uh, uh, topic for point acute ultrasound is that point acute ultrasound can also be used to determine volume responsiveness in a similar manner by looking for what ultrasound uses to represent stroke volume, which is the velocity time interval. So let's go into this a little bit further. So basic physiologic uh, parameters and understanding of um, the patient's frank Starling curve shows us that in the area in which there is a large change in the patient's stroke volume, uh, meaning that uh, they are preload responsive, so in other words, if you give volume in this range here, uh, you will increase the patient's stroke volume uh, more than uh, 10 to 15 percent, uh, is the target area of which when you want to optimize the patient's volume status. Many uh, different assessments of uh, hemodynamic uh, values and technologies have looked to see that in fact when somebody has controlled mechanical ventilation in which the intrathoracic pressure fluctuations are consistent and the same, you can look at how this change in intrathoracic pressure affects the intrathoracic blood volume affecting preload uh, and therefore causing fluctuations in stroke volume or some parameter that's related to the patient's stroke volume. Uh, for example, when you look at our arterial waveform shown here, giving a mechanical um, positive pressure breath will cause a brief alteration or positivity in that uh, stroke volume uh, representation value uh, seen on the A-line here and then have that trend back down. And how much this percent changes from the max to the min it has been shown to be a volume responsive parameter indicating that somebody is on this uh, steep portion of their Frank Starling curve. So this has again been shown throughout the literature of very, and various technologies exist that look um, at some representation of stroke volume and look for variations in that secondary to these phenomenons here in somebody who's control mechanical ventilation you can look at that alteration of that consistent control mechanical ventilation on the representation of the stroke volume and look at that percent difference uh, to determine someone who is at the steep portion of the frank starling curve many of these have shown that a 50 percent 15 percent change uh, in whatever parameter you're looking at that representation represents the patient's stroke volume uh, is a marker for volume responsiveness. Important thing to realize that the concept of using VTI or velocity time integral when it comes to point of care ultrasonography is just as an effective technique uh, to evaluate for uh, variation um, in the patient's filling status. So let's try to show that again here. So the idea of velocity time integral relates to the idea of uh, how any uh, determination of stroke volume occurs. So when you have pulsatility across any structure, the magnitude of that pulsatility and the area under that uh, curve of that pulsatility um, waveform uh, it represents stroke volume. So when the arterial waveform, we look at the area under the curve there to look for stroke volume. Same thing with uh, ultrasound. You can get a Doppler waveform shown here and you can uh, trace out this uh, waveform pattern and fill in this area and this area will be called the velocity time integral and since it's a summation of all the uh, velocities during that one um, cardiac cycle and that summation of all the velocities or the velocity time integral uh, again relates to the patient's stroke volume so if we use Doppler ultrasound, either continuous wave or pulse wave Doppler, we can get this Doppler waveform signal. And if we look for alterations in this Doppler waveform signal or in the velocity time integral, 
you can use that as a predictor of fluid responsiveness, just as similar as you would look at pulse pressure variation or pleth variability index or stroke volume variation with the same uh, percent change of 12 to 15 percent representing uh, somebody who is fluid responsive. So what areas do we actually want to assess this Doppler waveform? Well, the way to answer that is based on one, the literature, and two, based on uh, areas that would avoid uh, pathology. So a common area that we use to evaluate uh, velocity time interval, particularly looking for variations in this to determine fluid responsiveness, is the left ventricular alpha track. And the reason for this is something that you could probably imagine. Very few adults, uh, or less commonly, do adults have disease in their left ventricular alpha track uh, than, say, for example, cardiac valves. And so for that, because of the fact that the uh, waveform pattern is not altered by pathology, you can look at that as an accurate representation of the patient's stroke volume, or at least the percent change in their stroke volume. So when it comes to assessment of velocity time integral for this idea of looking for fluid responsiveness, the most validated technique and approach is looking at the left ventricle alpha track. So where do we see the left ventricle alpha track? Well, that has to do uh, with which cardiac view to assess, and again, uh, we'll talk more about this, particularly when we get to the cardiac section. But the apical five-chamber view is the ideal view to identify uh, the left ventricular alpha tract. So as the slide shows here, because the left ventricular alpha tract is relatively uh, easy to identify and less predisposed to pathology um, than cardiac valves, it is a common area that we look to see a Doppler waveform pattern with the idea of looking for variation in that VTI waveform. And again, VTI is simply just a tracing of the Doppler waveform. Important to realize that you don't necessarily have to look at the heart to get an idea of variation in VTI. In fact, uh, ultrasound or Doppler ultrasonography of any arterial structure will give you a Doppler waveform, and you can assess the variation in that Doppler waveform similarly uh, as you would if you were doing the left ventricular or cardiac um, a view. Particular areas that have been evaluated in the literature include Doppler ultrasound of the radial, brachial, femoral, and carotid arteries. Very important to realize that again what we're trying to look for is that we're not trying to evaluate the patient's actual stroke volume, simply looking to see for the variation in that waveform to tell whether or not somebody is fluid responsive. And that is why you can use um, uh, Doppler ultrasonography of any of these vessels. And again, this has been shown to be similar to stroke volume variation, plus variability index, and pulse pressure variation. So to review the common areas that we normally would look um, via this technique, the apical five-chamber view, which again, we will practice much more on when we go into the cardiac section. Apical um, is the idea is having the ultrasound window shining through the apex of the left ventricle, such that we're able to get the left ventricle alpha track, which is shown here. To obtain that view, um, We'll go into that in the hands-on section. This is a, a Doppler waveform pattern here of someone's uh, 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 left ventricular alpha track, and you can see quite a variation in the waveform pattern. Moving to a five-chamber view is the key aspect of uh, the left ventricular alpha track uh, assessment. And we'll talk about, by, as the video shows here, that the requirement of going from the four chamber to five chamber view simply means lowering the angle uh, with your ultrasound probe. And I'll try to demonstrate that. And again, we'll reorient uh, you to all these different cardiac views and assessments when we get into the cardiac section. I would focus on the principle here of saying that when we use Doppler ultrasound, particularly at the left ventricular alpha tract or at any um, vascular structure, we're looking at the tracing of that Doppler waveform and looking at the percent change in that VTI signal um, as we are uh, from the biggest waveform to the smallest to determine fluid responsiveness. This is just a cross-section of showing the four-chamber view versus five-chamber view and how do you achieve that five-chamber view? By lowering your angle with the skin, which I'll demonstrate here. So structures that we're seeing here, here's the right ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left ventricle, but the differences between the four-chamber and the five-chamber view are here, 
where you have the left atrium and mitral valve, and here you have the left atrium a little bit more uh, uh, cut out uh, because now you have the presence of the left ventricular outflow tract uh, and the aortic valve. So again, you want a Doppler along this left ventricular outflow tract, shown here. Continuous wave Doppler, um, again, allows you to assess the summation of velocities all across this window um, versus, uh, but however, remember, your waveform will not be as crisp, and so your measurements, therefore, will be uh, potentially more uh, variable. Pulse wave Doppler, it gives you that ability to assess specific locations and it, ideal for the use of looking at the left ventricular outflow tract. You see again that the, the picture quality is just much more uh, detailed because you're only getting a specific location. Other areas for assessment, so this is an article that was published showing that uh, a Dopplering of the carotid flow can determine fluid responsiveness. And again, since we are often um, close uh, to, and have frequent ability to scan the carotid, I encourage uh, everyone to evaluate this technique as a measure and, te and, and modality to evaluate for fluid responsiveness. Uh, this is an ultrasound of my own carotid uh, here, shown that uh, again we're getting the Doppler waveform and I'm looking for variations. Limitations of this uh, parameter are very similar to stroke volume variation and post-pressure variation. You need to have controlled mechanical ventilation uh, to be able to actually look at this percent change uh, and determine the difference. Similarly, you could also do a passive leg raise to evaluate your patient uh, if uh, you do not want to give a fluid bolus and look to see uh, for changes in the VTI after one minute of doing the 45 degree uh, heads up versus uh, leg up position changes. And again, you can read the text here that what you're looking for is more than 50% change in uh, VTI to determine fluid responsiveness. Go ahead and uh, go on to the hands-on section for this topic. So very different uh, approaches, but uh, we'll just go into the cardiac section first. So to get the cardiac <clears throat> five chamber view of the left ventricular alpha track. Again, we'll re emphasize this when we go into the heart section. I want to feel the PMI of my patient or place the probe roughly at the uh, sixth or seventh rib space, one nip uh, rib space below the nipple line. Indicator here will be at the three o'clock position such that my ultrasound plane is now scanning up to the heart in this fashion. We'll then go and allow ourselves to shine and get the ultrasound probe just through the apex here. You can see there's a lung trying to come off. And so there now we're starting to see cardiac structures. Of the apical view. So now we have the four chamber view to get the fifth chamber or the left ventricular outflow tract, please notice what I'm doing with the probe. I'm lowering my angle such that now exposing the left ventricular outflow tract in the view. So here we go from a four chamber view showing the right ventricle, left ventricle, right ventricle, left ventricle, um, and left atrium, right atrium. By lowering my angle with the probe, we're able to now get the left ventricular outflow tract in view. My indicator again is at the three o'clock position, one rib space below the nipple line, now I'm going to activate my pulse wave Doppler ultrasound, placing it just at that level of the left ventricular alpha track, and we get this waveform pattern here. And now we would look at this waveform pattern and trace out this uh, and compare the tracing here to the smallest tracing to evaluate for whether or not someone had uh, volume responsive state uh, by looking for a greater than 50% change. Very important again to re-emphasize same limitations of this parameter as with any uh, dynamic monitoring uh, parameter of stroke volume variation to pulse pressure variation. You need to make sure that your patient has uh, controlled mechanical ventilation uh, and has no uh, uh, irregular uh, cardiac rhythms that would produce that variation without representing uh, a underfilled or, or volume responsive state.
Okay, thank you very much.